So this slide here points out the fundamental, um, what you might call technology or idea, um, underlying the analysis of the experiment. And I notice here that a lot of things we do basically give you events, which are um, which are illustrated here by taking a survey when, uh, if you follow the presidential election, I followed a lot often the surveys that were done at the time, and they would produce uh, counts of the number of people who thought uh, particular uh, candidates would win particular elections. And so you could say, when they say they rang up 1,500 likely voters, then they would produce 1,500 or 1,500 events, which in each of those events consist of the results of the phone call to those um, voters. So a survey produces events as, as an answer. Uh, but in the case of the physics experiment, the events consist not of the answers of an individual to what they felt about various questions. It consisted of this list of particles produced in the event. And once we've got, say, in this physics experiment, um, the, the information, um, we then write software which takes the event in this original form, which in this original form is just the raw hardware with of what happens when particles go through magnets, go through, go through chambers, uh, and they go into so-called calorimeters. Then we take a software system that maps the event in one form into an event in a different form. Another example of where you see events is uh, sensors, um, all sorts of sensors. They can be um, temperature sensors or what have you. They give results. Those results are a function of time, and uh, each time that uh, that uh, sensor triggers and gives you a result is an event. Uh, that maybe it's clearer, maybe for a seismic sensor, where, because those seismic sensors are not going to give you continuous events, but they'll give you events when something happens. Uh, there's some shaking of the earth if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's measuring motion. And that's a good example of an event-based measurement. Uh, for surveys, the answers to individual questions are often yes or no. In the case of the physics, the answer is not initially yes or no, but after the software, it eventually ends up yes or no, because the result is going to be a histogram. And a histogram basically counts a whole set of yes, no answers. Namely, the first bin in that histogram was, a, was a, say, a, well, a, a bin in mass from, say, 100 to 102 GeV. And then that is counting the number of events that answered yes to the question, my mass lies between 100 and 102. Other events would uh, put entries into the, um, into the uh, bin that went from 126 to 128, and so on. Now we come to uh, a discussion of um, the Python codes that are uh, part of this course. Um, here is the actual uh, initial uh, software, which we'll be discussing in, in some detail. Um, let's first, uh, before looking at this code, uh, tell you how to, how to get this Python. Um, everything we do here is done with this Python distribution here from the NThought website. And that's because it has a lot of useful packages for data analysis, broadly applicable. That's the so-called NumPy package, the SciPy package, and the plotting package, which is called Matplotlib. And then it also has, as part of a NumPy, um, the IPython uh, package, which integrates the processing capability of Python with the plotting capability of Matplotlib. So you get interactively pictures, or in this, which we'll initially do for histograms for our um, emulation of what a LHC experiment might do. If you wanted to explore these points in more detail, I can recommend this book here, Python for Data Analysis, which is an O'Reilly book. Uh, I just got the downloaded version, as you can see, it's pretty modern, October 2012. And it has lots of good examples of how to use this basic NThought package.
Now let's look at this uh, software here, which you can um, run on, say, IPython. Just cut and paste it into IPython, and it will run, and it will produce um, this, uh, this software here, followed by histogram command, which we'll give later, um, will um, produce your plot. This just produces here some of the data to be plotted. And this, if you like, is the so-called Monte Carlo um, software. It's software that's generating results which would look like um, the actual experiment. So let's um, uh, see what we have here. This command here, base equals 110 plus 30 uh, times a random number generator, and that's executed 42,000 times. This is generating events between 110 and 140 GeV. That's because the random number generator is between 0 and 1. So 110 plus 30 times that random number is, lies between 110 and 140 uniformly. And that's producing the so-called background. Remember, we, uh, we looked at the previous picture. We had um, uh, background and signal is the signal. And so we're going to generate each of those um, separately. Also notice the background, if I go from 110, I didn't bother to go the full range. I just did 110 to 140. The background is decreasing, and it's about half the size at 140 as it is at 110. So if we look at this software, we now have the, the, this um, first statement on Base is actually generating not a sloping background, but a uniform background. And later on, we'll just study uniform backgrounds just so we don't get into too many complicated things at this stage. Um, but this code here actually generates the appropriate sloping background, which is called this uh, Python array sloping. Um, this consists of a whole set of events between 110 and 140 GV distributed so that there's um, there are twice as many events are near the beginning of the plot at 110 as they are at the end uh, where it's 30. And that factor of two is generated ingeniously by this technology here where we set uh, index to be uh, a number that runs, which is one. Um, so index is a test, which is true if um, this uh, expression here, which is um, which is a function of the mass, which is the thing that's generated here in base. And it's, we, we, this expression here is true if um, the, um, this number, which is 1 for mass of 110, and it's a half for a mass of 140, is greater than, a, than a, another random number, which is just a set of random numbers between 0 and 1. So this index, this instruction here, generates randomly a cutoff, which uh, is uh, produces a no cut for a low mass and a high mass. It cuts off half the events, and so sloping equals base of index actually gives you a set of random numbers, which are between 110 and 140, with the number at 140 half as likely as the number of one. This so-called accept project technology we'll discuss a little later on, but for most of this uh, rest of the session, we will not bother to discuss it. We will discuss this one here. Gauss equals two times two times uh, the so-called rand n generates a so-called Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, and it's um, centered at 126 with a width of two. And this is roughly what you might expect for the Higgs. Uh, the number two is um, just gotten by looking at the picture by, by me. Because the width of the Higgs is not a width due to physics. The, uh, if there were, if physics was um, um, to be uh, believed, that width is very tiny. The reason why that width is broad for that Higgs is a broad smear of a, of a few GV wide is solely due to measurement error. And so this, uh, if something is due to measurement error, you'd expect it to be distributed Gaussianly. And he, so this is a Gaussian uh, distribution with uh, 
this number 300 is the number of Higgs events which uh, I estimated to be present in the previous plot. And so this gives you a Gaussian distribution of 300 events of, of width uh, 2 and center the, the mass of 126. Here to give a, a Bob, give an example of what would happen if you did a better, I mean, a far more expensive experiment and measured everything uh, so that the error is four times smaller. This is the so-called narrow gas. And then we, uh, to get the total number of events, we add them, we, uh, we concatenate them together or add them together. And so I should say, we're not adding events numerically, we're accumulating a new set, which is the sum of the two sets. We Here we have the sloping set plus the Gauss set. That's what you would get if you uh, produced a broad Higgs on the sloping background. And here we have the narrow total, which is what you get if you uh, take that uh, same background and put a narrow Gauss, a narrow Higgs on top of it.